Welcome to Buy, Sell, Hold. I'm Mark Green from the Cars Yeah! podcast. And I'm Keith Martin from Sports Car Market Magazine. This is show number 28. Welcome to Buy, Sell, Hold, the sports car market podcast. Market experts and car friends for over 30 years, Keith Martin and Mark Green have come together through their mutual love for collector cars. Keith and Mark will take you on a ride into the collector car market, talking with industry experts, helping you navigate your collector car journey so that you know when to make your own decisions to buy, sell, or hold. Buy, Sell, Hold is all about the essence of collecting. The collector car world is comprised of people who buy, they sell, and they hold the cars they love. Here on Buy, Sell, Hold, Keith and I talk to industry leaders, collectors, auction houses, consigners, sellers, and more who are experts in the market. So, Keith, who do we have the honor of talking with today? Mark, our guest today is Randy Nonnenberg, who is the co-founder of Bring a Trailer. Hello, Randy. Welcome to Buy, Sell, Hold. Let's jump right in. Today on this show, we're going to talk about three cars that have been very important to you in your life, and also about the exciting changes that are coming to bring a trailer. If you could describe the collector car market today in one word, what would it be and why? Thanks for having me, Keith and Mark. Uh, if I had to describe the market in one word, I would call it intelligent. And why would you call it intelligent? That's an interesting word for this market today. Yeah, absolutely. I think buyers are really educated, and I think there are many tools now that didn't used to exist. So I think the old way of buying and selling uh, with little information, with a lot of sort of hyperbole and exaggeration, and you know maybe a photo or two online, or maybe just a half a day to look at it at an auction, something like that. I think the research tools out there um, are on the level of uh, what they are in the real estate business on a Zillow or a Redfin. And you can find historical trends. You can find uh, all sorts of data out there that I think uh, makes the buyer and now the seller really know what's going on. Uh, and I think that means that technology can be used in a different way. And I think we're in sort of a different era for how to buy and sell. Absolutely. You know, the other thing that comes to my mind with your site, and first and foremost, Randy, I want to say, hey, you're eating up a lot of my life because every day I get your emails and I sit there and go, okay, which cars did I not realize I wanted to buy today? So thank you for that. It's a nice way to start every morning with my cup of coffee. One of the things that's great about how you explain this intelligence is your viewers get to make comments. And I love the addition you guys did where not relative, relevant, I should say, <laughs> or not intelligent comments are kind of highlighted because sometimes people say things that you go, what on earth are you talking about? But I love the engagement that happens and we realize it's not all real or certified or whatever, but that's what makes looking at the cars so fun for me personally. That's great. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely real and you get the, you, it runs the gamut, but there's, uh, you know, an amazing different dynamic that comes from allowing a car that's being sold to be also discussed. It really elevates the truthfulness necessary. And it also allows more information and more expertise to come into the room, right? I mean, when Keith comments on a car or when another expert comments on a car, everybody kind of is like, oh, wow, like that's, that's helpful and that's additive and that eliminates some of the sort of murkiness or questions that flow around the collector car biz about what exactly is being sold, who's got their hand in the cookie jar, sort of sort of skepticism. So we've really tried to design it so that it elevates the uh, experience and the truthfulness and at the end of the day, the, the satisfied buyer. So let me give you a quick example, uh, Randy. I recently bought a 1971 Series 3 Jag V12 on Bring a Trailer and what I've learned to do, when, if there's a car I'm interested in, I just sit back because all the experts will pile in. And during the course of the week, they give me an education through their questions about what I should be looking for, even if I don't know a car very well. It's, it's, uh, it's like having the, being at a club meeting and having the gang around you while you're looking at the car. That's what we want it to be, right? And it's not perfect. And some, you know, sometimes there's something out of left field a little bit. But you're right. If you sit back and look at the information on the whole, the goal is for it to be additive like that. And hopefully that uh, it sounds like it worked. It increased your understanding, at least, of what was there and uh, allowed you to move forward. So, yeah, that is that is the goal. And that's what we've tried to always strive for. Well, you know, Randy, getting getting uh, Keith to buy a car isn't really that hard. <laughs> <laughs> we've done, I've done it a couple times. I mean, 
mean, a few people have done it a couple times, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, what I love, Randy, is when you're when you're looking at one of the cars for sale on your site and somebody says, you know, in picture 17, the Framistat looks like it's a light pink and I think it should be green. Seller, can you comment on that? Yes. I love that. I actually love it as long as it's not with two seconds to go in the bidding. I know. Right? That kind of is, is absurd. But, uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, that's a legit uh, – legit thing to keep a keep a seller on their toes and you know when a seller comes back and is good with an answer and either has a great answer about the shade of the temp needle or whatever or honestly even if they say hey i don't know but you know yeah. uh, happy to answer any questions and just shows that they're an honest trying to be helpful person that increases confidence too you don't have to be albert einstein to sell a car on vat you just have to be sort of available and helpful that's all people really want Right. And if, and if somebody, if a seller, you know, doesn't respond to my questions, it starts making me really think, does he really know anything about this car? I mean, what's going on? So you want that to be a two way street, that relationship. Yep, absolutely. And honestly, you want that in every auction and you want that everywhere on the Internet. But typically, you just really don't get it there. And there's just this positive, positive sort of dynamic around VAT to, to make it really available and public. And, and I think that's a that's a sort of new frontier and, and points towards that sort of intelligence. Right. Everybody has more information and that's good. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I noticed uh, yesterday, you, you know, you guys have cars from a very low end to you sold a, a Mira for nine hundred plus thousand dollars. So there's everything for everybody on Bring a Trailer. Yeah, I, I think once upon a time, people uh, tended to think, oh, the Internet is or, or eBay or whatever. I mean, that's for selling sort of low dollar stuff, sort of random corner case stuff. But uh, I think uh, we're trying to uh, offer this and, and put upward pressure on that and see how far it can go. Right. We've honestly, we never had a limit. Who knows what could sell there. And, uh, obviously a Mira trading at 990,000 yes. seems like that would have been at a, at a big 10 auction or at a very, you know, fancy collector car dealer or something like that exclusively. And I think that's evolving. I don't think that's a tidal wave. Like all of those are going to jump online and immediately, but, uh, we've definitely proven that it can be done and can be done well. And yeah, that buyer and seller are super happy. So, I mean, they, uh, they made it work. So we're continually surprised, right? Uh, that's the second highest sale ever on VAT. Uh, the other was a gold wing for a little more than that. And it's, those cars are, are viable in this space. And, uh, the fun part about it is just sort of breaking down the expectations and, and people who think, that there are absolute rules. There aren't necessarily absolute rules, and, and innovation can, can push past those sort of predispositions, which is fun to see. Yes, absolutely. Well, I love disruptors, and I always looked at you as a disruptor with what you're doing, so uh, kudos to you and the team. And I've had many friends who bought cars on Bring a Trailer, and I've had not one say it was a bad experience. Everyone has great things to say about what you've done and what you've built. So let me give you a proper introduction here for if there's anyone listening that doesn't know about Bring a Trailer. I doubt it, uh, but let me do that, and then we'll jump into the questions here. Randy Nonenberg is the co-founder and president of Bring a Trailer, an online Online auction marketplace for collectible vehicles and much more. He's from Northern California and worked in engineering and production at Audi and BMW for 10 years before taking the leap and bringing Bring a Trailer to a full-time position starting in 2010. He got the car bug from his dad while living in Stuttgart, Germany at a very early age. Bat, as we regulars like to call Bring a Trailer, brings automotive enthusiasts a daily dose of automobiles that are available for sale from around the world. Your daily dose of Bat is like having your own personal assistant who scouts out all those cool cars, trucks, motorcycles, and parts for sale just for you. We'll be back in just a minute to talk with more about Randy, about buying, selling, holding cars. But first, a word from our sponsors that make this show possible. Sit tight, keep your seatbelt on. We're coming right back. Since 1969, Larry's Thunderbird and Mustang Parts has been the source for parts for your 55 to 66 Ford Thunderbird, 64 to 73 Ford Mustang, and 54 to 57 Ford passenger cars. Located right here in the USA, Larry's is also one of the industry's largest in-house upholstery manufacturers, supplying enthusiasts across the globe and many of the world's largest and most prominent parts houses and restorers. Their experienced and knowledgeable sales team will help you get the right parts at the right price the first time. Buy, sell, hold listeners. Use promo code BSH2020 and get 15% discount on web orders. That's BSH2020. Worldwide shipping is available. Call or visit them now at www.larrystbird.com. And remember, BSH 2020 for your 15% discount. 
Are you thinking of buying a car at an online auction, but worried about how to make a good decision? I'm Keith Martin from Sports Car Market, and I'm here to tell you about an exciting new product we've developed to help you be a smarter collector. The SCM Guide to Buying Online is an immediate digital download. It includes five questions to always ask and why. Also, how to protect yourself while buying online from our Legal Files columnist, John Dranius, and our auction editors walk you through what you can and can't learn from a photo. Visit www.sportscarmarket.com slash buying online to purchase your copy today. It's an immediate digital download, and it's only $10. Again, that's www.sportscarmarket.com slash buying online, and get ready to be a smarter collector. All right, we are back, so Keith, take it away. Randy, today we're going to talk about three vehicles that have played a role in your life. A special vehicle that you bought, one you've sold, and one you would never let go of. Let's start with the purchase. Tell us about what the car is, what attracted you to it, and what the chase was like for you to acquire it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited about this segment. So the car is a 1956 Chrysler 300B, which is a model that I have always kind of had uh, in the corner of my mind as sort of a dream. Uh, I bought this one about two and a half years ago. Many people wouldn't think that a 50s giant American coupe would be on the radar of someone uh, like me who's, you know, 42 years old and uh, has a bunch of, you know, trucks and imported cars and, you know, 90s cars and all that sort of thing. This one's a little outside the realm, but it's a it's a fun story. Well, we want to hear more. Tell us about why, what, when, how hard was it to get? Yeah, absolutely. So I, it's, it's, for me, it's really all about that model. It's not this car in particular, but it's about that model. I grew up going to car shows with my dad and a lot of that was, you know, in the American car space, you know, good guys shows, different sorts of things like that. But this car was always just sort of at the peak. I, I didn't really want a Cadillac or even a 57 Chevy or anything. The Chrysler, given that it has the Hemi, you guys know this car. I don't have to educate you guys, but it's sort of a corner case American car for some people. Yeah. But the fact that it won, it won in, you know, NASCAR in 55 and 56, and it has, you know, the early Hemi with the two huge uh, dual carbs on it. And it's just a low roof line swept two door hardtop shape that was really kind of an early muscle car. And they made 1,100 of them, I think 1,156. And it was always for me just this sort of dream uh, that always seemed out there to be able to get a 56 Chrysler 300B. So I, I chased this one down. And something that's neat that was sort of the instigator for the timing and this car in particular was my dad and I have been doing some of the classic rallies around the country over the past few years and really started that maybe a decade or so ago. It's been a cool way to spend time together. And also, I'm really big into driving and adding uh, uh, miles onto cars. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. I've I've come up to Portland where you guys are and done the Monty Shelton and some other events and haven't done the SCM event yet, but I'm excited to do it. And so we saw it's always good to have something on the calendar that kind of kicks you forward to make sure you get something done. So I needed to come up with a car before we were going to do the Copper State 1000, which is an event in Arizona. And that event was going to the Grand Canyon. And I said, what's the best car ever to drive to the Grand Canyon with my with my dad? And we decided, let's get the Chrysler. Let's find one. So it was about a four or five month process. You know, they only made 1,100 of them and a couple hundred are now available. But there's usually one or two for sale at any given time. And they only came in three colors. You know, it's just not a, it's not a wide array. So I was able to find a, a, you know, regimental red 56 with, you know, some cool options and Kelsey's wire wheels, like the right wheels. And the thing is, oh man, it's really sweet. It's 19 feet long though. It's kind of hard to park. Oh my gosh. So, so, so Randy, where did you find this car? So I ended up finding this one um, from a private party down in Southern California. And interestingly, I mean, I, this is one of those cars like you guys, right? I mean, I had been kind of tracking these, even though I wasn't going to buy one. This is sort of the BAT story, right? I mean, I kind of like track cars around and watch them and watch certain models that I was really hot for, whether I could buy them or not. And this was the resurgence of a car that was in... I think Paso Robles, central coast of California, like four years ago. And I had remember saving those photos to my desktop on some weird classified site. I mean, it wasn't mainstream. Uh, It was like some under the radar classified site. And then it got away, obviously, years ago. And then I find this one was listed 
I think, where was it? It was on collector, tra- you know, collector car trader or one of those, you know, places you got to dig around. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And so I found it there, but then, you know, linked it back to this previous time uh, and sent it to my dad. I was like, this was the Paso car from a bunch of years ago. And, and uh, so anyway, we kind of had a, a shared laugh and uh, enjoyment of that sort of uh, hunting experience, you know? How fun. Once you contacted the seller, tell us about how the transaction went. Was it simple, easy? Well, it was. there was time pressure, which is never, never great, right? Because I needed to get it, check it out, and I needed to get it to Arizona. Uh, and, and we started to get towards, you know, a, a number of weeks, not a number of months out. And it started to be like, okay, it's time to make a decision. So there was one car in Tennessee that was an option. There was this car in SoCal. And there's a couple other ones with like blurry photos and, you know, bad communication online. So I was like, oh, man. So uh, this car like checked a lot of the boxes and it was sort of mid mid range to high range on price. But what we needed and as you guys know, what you need for rally events are a car that's going to get you there. Right. A lot of these (laughs) this model in particular, like the Concorde restored cars that nobody puts any miles on them. And if you go try to drive them a thousand miles, they're going to you know leave you on the road. So this this car was cool because it was owned by sort of a hot rodder, uh, restorer guy, private party guy in, in uh, near Pasadena. And he's like, yeah, I, I run this car up and down on uh, drives with, uh, with his sort of gang of buddies. And I was like, oh, great. You know, the tires are going to be round on this car, not square. And the fuel system is <laughs> going to be OK, you know, and it's not perfect. You know, it's it's like, a I don't know, an, an eight and a half or a nine out of ten. I mean, it's, it's really nice, but it's never, you know, it's not like super show car. But when we were driving it on the events, it, it you know, we took it straight to Arizona, fired it up, had it detailed, fired it up, you know, changed fluids just for crossing our fingers a little bit and went for it. And it, that's kind of so, a so- cowboy move, but it worked. So, Randy, did you have buy the car in SoCal, have it shipped to the San Francisco area, check it out there, and then ship it to Arizona? No, we, uh, my dad and I jumped on a Southwest flight to SoCal. So we did do a test drive with the owner, which is something we probably couldn't have done for the Nashville car or elsewhere. So we met the guy and we're in his garage and looked through the photo book and the whole deal. It was pretty cool. The guy was a good guy. And he actually had a lift at his house, which gave me some solace, right? That was kind of cool to crawl around underneath it. And then... You know, we walked around in the guy's street and like figured out if we we're going to do the deal. And I came to resolution. OK, let's make an offer. Let's do it. And we made it happen. And then, no, we sent a truck down there and the truck took it straight from SoCal to Arizona. And we flew back from Northern California and sort of brokered the rest of the deal remotely. So we went to meet it in Arizona to do the event, which was pretty crazy, but it worked. So, Randy, let me ask you this. Can you recall what it was like when you were in Arizona at the beginning of the Copper State in your dream car? What's your memory of the first time you got behind the wheel and set off on the Copper State? Oh, man, it was so good. I, I, you may know there that they, they like stage all the cars for you on this grass, like baseball field there. It's kind of an unusual starting moment. But before I got on the plane to fly down there, my dad was a couple hours ahead and the, the shipper who uh, took great care of us set the car out there. And I got a picture of it, like as I was in the terminal up here in San Francisco of the car on the lawn, like in the Arizona sunshine. And I was just like, oh, my goodness, I was so giddy on the uh, on the flight. Nice. Sounds like an awesome deal. Well, listen, let's move to the next question here. And by the way, guys, if for some reason you lose me, I'm looking out my window here. There's some people working on the transformer box that has all my cable and power connections. I don't know what they're doing out there. They're from the city. Th- those are those are the SCM sleuths, Mark. We're, right. we're tapping into your system here. Okay, great. Okay. Well, <laughs> if for some reason you lose me, that's why. But I'm praying that they don't do anything stupid out there. So we'll, we'll go. We'll keep going here. So, Randy, you were my 43rd guest on the Cars Yeah podcast way back in July of 2014. You know, I want to thank you for that. That's back when I was just starting out, trying to figure out what the heck I was doing. I'm up to almost, well, guess 1,600 now. So. Uh, since then, you have come a long way, baby, and we're going to learn a lot more about what's going on at Bring a Trailer, and I want to congratulate you on what you've built over these last six years. It's absolutely phenomenal. Let's talk about a significant vehicle that you've owned and that you've sold, uh, a vehicle that uh, was something that maybe you didn't want to sell or maybe you did. Uh, was that process easy or complicated? And looking back now, are you sorry that you let it go? So what was that car? 
Uh, that car for me uh, was a 1990 BMW M3. So I'm going to cover their whole gamut here, you guys. 50s <laughs> yeah. cars, 90s cars, yeah, uh, all of it. And uh, that's sort of how my tastes run. You know, I, I love all sorts of different cars. But this car, yeah, kind of needs no introduction. Obviously, a, a very popular model from the 90s, uh, late 80s and 90s. Um, and they've gone up in value quite a bit, but it, just independent of the value, just the, the sort of icon status of that from motorsport. Uh, and sort of the heyday of BMW. I worked for BMW, as you guys said, and I've always been a big fan of German cars and that brand. And that was always the sort of halo car. So I was able to get my hands on one of those. I believe it was uh, 2012 or so, 2012, 2013. Uh, But this is about how it was sold. And the reason that one is significant is because that one was part of the group that we use to launch BAT auctions. So it was on the first day of BAT auctions. We put these three cars up, uh, no reserve, and they all sold. And that one was one. It kind of was necessary to test the website and move it along, but I really didn't want to. That was kind of the one. It was like, <laughs> yeah. oh man, yeah. this is going to be a great, it's going to be a great business decision, but a terrible personal decision. And it sold, uh, it sold on uh, just because it was not only a special model, but that example was like, you know, people can really geek out on on options and be uh, BMW of that era, and it was, you know, white, the black interior with the right upgraded plus one uh, wheels from the European cars. And it had been owned uh, by a couple guys that had really taken care of it and done right by the car. And man, I just love that thing. And then I, I uh, did regret selling it, but you know, times, times move on and you can't own all the cars you want if you hold on to all of them. So it, it had to go. Yeah. Randy, if, if that exact car were to come along again, would you buy it? So it's interesting that you mentioned that. That's exactly, I knew, obviously knew the person that it went to on BAT and he kept it for a long time. And he was like, Randy, maybe someday I'll sell it, right? Really good guy out of the East Coast. The cool part was he actually came to one of our BAT alumni gatherings with the car that I was at, that was at Lime Rock Park. So I actually got to see the car again. And I was like, oh, it was, it was, uh, you know, the one that got away. So that was super cool. And uh, maybe someday, maybe someday I'll be able to get my hands on that thing again. (laughs) There you go. Well, uh, I hope so. I have a good friend that just sold his. He had a spectacular car and he actually was going to take it somewhere to have some work done and then put it up for sale. And the place he had it stored, uh, somebody came, had come in the day before to pick up one of their cars and said, Do you know, who owns that M3. I'd like to buy that. And so he met with the guy that afternoon. The guy said, I want your car. So my friend Bill said, he thought in his head, he goes, okay, here's the price I wanted. He added dollars to it, thinking the guy would just laugh. And he said, where do I wire the money? And there you go. But he had an exceptional, very low mileage, all original car, but they are wonderful cars. So Keith, let's uh, talk to Randy about the one that he'll never let go. Take it away. Yeah, Randy, tell tell us about a car that, that really is close to your heart and that you know, either you, you think you'll never sell it or a car that you've had like that that was really important to you. Talk about that kind of car. Yeah, I've absolutely got that. So I, I, I'll give you a little backstory first. Uh, I grew up in the Bay Area in Northern California, and all of my friends and I, when we were too young to have a driver's license, uh, and then as we all got our driver's licenses, all got you know trucks where the tops came off, right? Like 80s, 90s, that's where as everybody wanted Jeeps and Land Cruisers and Broncos and Scouts and all this stuff that's really popular and crazy now to see trading as collectibles. But back then they were just in everybody's garages and that's what it was just sort of part of the culture. That's what everybody drove. And so my first car was a Toyota Land Cruiser FJ40. And I love those. I always, for whatever reason, I picked that flavor, right? Could have picked any of those flavors that all my buddies had, but I ended up being a Land Cruiser guy back then. This is in like 92. I got my license in 93. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> pouring over pages of cars, you mean, you know, in, uh, in, auto trader and the old uh, paper collector trader and that sort of stuff was how you'd find them back then. So I had that back in the day. And then I, like so many people, I sold it, right? I moved on to to other types of cars through high school and and college. And so then my first paycheck out of college, I decided, you know what? I want another FJ40. I shouldn't have sold it six years ago at that time or whatever it was. So this is about 2000. I said, I'm going to get another one. 
and I'm going to build it just like that one that I had, right? Because the one that I had, you can't just buy off the shelf. It was customized, and I was never going to find that exact one. So I bought that for $3,500 and brought it home to my dad's garage at the time. I didn't have a garage. I had an apartment. And I did a you know body-off restoration of this uh, Toyota Land Cruiser. And that was in 01. Uh, it took about you know a year or so to do it, which was crazy, right out of college with my first job. But I still have that today. So that is one that, you know, I built it how I kind of wanted it. And there's a ton of nostalgia wrapped up in that. And honestly, it's not worth that too, that much money. It's probably not worth selling it to anybody else, but I will keep that truck for the foreseeable. I don't, I don't see any reason to ever sell that thing. So Randy, I have a question for you. The, the Land Rover Series 2 and 3 88s are about the same as the same size as the Toyota FJ. How would you compare those two rigs? That's a good question. So yeah, pretty, pretty different from a, you know, styling perspective, very different from a drivetrain perspective, the drivetrain, for whatever reason, the Toyotas were just really overbuilt, right? This six cylinder engine that was a copy of the Chevrolet pickup truck engine. And most of its competition back then, the Rover included, uh, most of them were running four cylinders or even little diesels, right? You could option a six cylinder on a, on a big Land Rover Series 2 109 in the US. And, and there's some corner cases, but all of the Land Cruisers came with really big axles and really big drive shafts and heavy duty running gear. And they weren't fast. That doesn't mean they're fast. It just means they were tough. So that's kind of what the Land Cruiser had going for it. Also had the, you know, the two-tone top. They both had that going on. They both have a lot of character in the design. And then the Rover, you know, aluminum body, and, you know, British heritage and, and different sorts of stuff that really appeal with those. I've owned a 109 as well, which I really loved. And they're, they're just different, you know. It's, it's so cool that there's so many of those different flavors from back then, from all the American trucks to uh, obviously Toyota coming from Japan and then uh, the British ones as well. It's just it's cool that there's variety. But, yeah, those two are pretty different. And they're now sought after as collectibles by all sorts of different folks and they go you know run through restoration shops and that sort of stuff but you know i mean i bought mine for 5500 bucks back back in the day in high school and then i ended up buying the piece of junk that i started with for this build for you know 3500 bucks they were just very accessible for a really long time and uh, it's a little bit less so now but they're still out there and they're they're really fun to bang around in if somebody came along today with a brand new toyota fj that 2020 2021 and said I'll trade you straight across for your vintage FJ. Would you take the deal? No deal. Come on. Come on, <laughs> Keith. You, you wouldn't do that either. You can't do that. The problem is, yeah, once you build one of these and pour your soul into it, it's kind of like it's really not about the money at that point. There, I have thought of, you know, man, all my problems would go away if I just would trade this thing for another FJ that had all the little quirks that mine has worked out already but i can't even get myself to do that you know it's like you're it's like your dog it's like your uh it's like your lab or your dog yeah. right i mean you're not gonna like trade it out for another one because it's better like it's, <laughs> this thing's with me and i and i uh i like it and uh i don't i don't really think it's ever gonna move on no, and there's a lot of companies out there now. Well, not a lot, but several companies that are rebuilding those, reimagining them, if you will. I've had a few of those guests on my Cars Out podcast, and they do some pr pretty phenomenal things. But there's nothing like, you know, for all of us, it's the memories of those old days coming back. And that's obviously what it is with you. And I'll remind our listeners, you can see a picture of Randy in that same vehicle on his show notes page on the Sports Car Market Magazine website and the Cars Out website with a big smile on his face looking through the windshield. So you can check it out on both of those websites. Let's take a short break and thank our sponsors here. And we come back, uh, Randy, Keith is going to talk to you about the perfect all-around collector car. So sit tight. We'll be right back. Here's another buy, sell, hold special offer. Do you love knowing what the collector car market has done when it comes to values? Of course you do. The Sports Car Market Platinum Auction Database puts 31 years of auction results right at your fingertips on your mobile device or your computer, no matter where in the world you are. With nearly 300,000 records, that's right, 300,000, it has the information you need to make an informed decision on that oh-so-important classic or vintage vehicle purchase. You'll receive all this for a mere $5.50 a month. That's less than the cost of a sandwich. As a Buy, Sell, Hold podcast listener, use the code Plat 50, that's right, P L A T 50, to get this special discount. Just go to sportscarmarket.com slash platinum 50, and the cart will automatically discount your order. Plus, 
Platinum subscribers also receive access to the full library of back issues of Keith Martin's Insider's Guides, a valuable resource for anyone in the market for collector vehicles. That's sportscarmarket.com slash platinum50. Get your discount today. Hey, Mark Green here. If you love the Buy, Sell, Hold podcast, you'll want to listen to my Cars Yeah podcast where over five years I've interviewed over 1,000 475 inspiring automotive enthusiasts. You'll have free access to my guest shows five days a week. These are amazing people who share their world around cars, trucks, and motorcycles. I take a deep dive into their businesses, and they share with you how they've wrapped their passion for vehicles into their lives. Plus, go to the CarsYeah.com website and hit the free book button, and I'll email you my free filler-up book. It's an ebook filled with beautiful fuel filler fun, and inspiring quotes from my past guests. Once subscribed, you'll get my weekly blog as well. You can find all the Cars yeah shows on CarsYeah.com or on any mobile device using your podcast app. Just search for Cars yeah Podcast and subscribe today. That way you'll get both Buy, Sell, Hold with Keith and me and the Cars yeah Podcast delivered right to your mobile device or your computer. Thanks for listening. Hey, Randy, we're back. So what would be the perfect all-around collector car for you. Not the most expensive, not the most unique, but one where you had it in your garage, and each time you looked at it, you thought, man, I'm going to take this out to a Cars and Coffee or a tour, go visit my friends, and this car just does it all for me. What car would that be? Uh, for me, that would be a 6566 in particular, Mustang Fastback, lowered down a little bit on torque thrust wheels, and a little bit Shelby eyes, but not explicitly, just sort of nicely performance modified for driving. I think that's a, a model that is still pretty accessible from a price point point of view. Parts are super cheap. It has a folding back seat, so you can kind of treat it like a two seater if that's your stage in life. Or me with three kids crawling around that want to like go on drives with me, I would fold up that back seat and throw them back in there, and you can go rip around with a small block and a either a you know cool five speed or something or you can have an automatic in it and air conditioning i mean it's just kind of that car has room inside everybody likes them you can modify them a little bit and make them actually perform reasonably well and you can go run them on an event or a tour just as much as you can you know just have fun with it in your garage that's a model that i've uh, had some experience with and and drove in my high school and college years a fair amount and then later brought a car similar to that up to do that rally up in Oregon and it just worked great. And it's just so, so easy to, to check all the boxes on that car. What would your budget be to get one, a uh, fastback that was, that was something you'd want to own that was in good condition. What would you want to pay? Yeah, I think, I mean, for 25 or 30, uh, thousand, you can get one of those. So, I mean, the ship has sailed on those being obviously $7,500 cars or 12, five or whatever they used to be. Those days are over. But yeah, I don't think it's too hard to find one of those in the in the you know twenty five to thirty k range. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect. I mean, if people want like a full on show car, you're going to spend a good amount more than that. But you know, solid driver, good paint, nice interior, nice color combo. You get the wheels right on those cars, and they're they're just cool. People people love them, and you can notch down. Sorry, funny choice of words there, but you can go down a little bit on price point and get a notch back, and maybe pay a little bit less for the entry. But I've always been a fastback guy, right? I grew up going to the racetrack and watching the GT three fifties race, and that that sound and look and and sort of thing has always been in my uh, in my veins. So I'm kind of a fastback guy, uh, but obviously you could do a convertible or a, or a coupe too if it floated your boat. Let's have a little moment of philosophy here. Let's say you've been looking for a fastback. You call me up and say, Keith, I found a notchback that's five grand less than a fastback. Uh, should I buy it and save the money? And I'd say, Randy, if you buy the notchback, every time you look at it, you're going to say, God, I wish I'd bought that fastback. I agree with you, right? I mean, on, on some level, You've got that 5K and you can make the jump. Like, you know, time is short. If anything coronavirus has taught us when you're locked up at home, it's like live life to the fullest. You know, <laughs> you yes. never know when you're going to be locked at home for months. It's like, should you pay a few grand extra and get the one that's really the dream or, you know, get the color that's really the dream or the, you know, options or whatever it is. I think we're seeing that a lot in the marketplace right now that people are like, you know, like it's it's time to take advantage of, of what you can do to, to enjoy yourself a little bit with these cars. And if, if Fastback is the dream, you're exactly right, Keith. You're, if you're always walking out of the garage and there's a notchback there, you're always going to be wishing. 
Those are the words of wisdom from the uh, guy who's been around the block many times, Keith Martin, for sure. And I'll tell you something, Randy. I had one of those. I had one of those that a friend of mine and his dad had built into a Shelby clone. They had done an amazing job with it. And I loved, I drove that car for two years to work every day. In the rain, everywhere I went with that car, I had instant friends. It was fun, enjoyable, and it was so far out of my wheelhouse of being a European sports car guy with BMW M3s and 911s. I really liked that car. I I really kind of wish I'd never let it go because it wasn't a real Shelby. I didn't worry about it. I enjoyed it. I drove it. I had fun with it. Yes, it's an awesome car. You need to find one. Yeah, fantastic story. And that that speaks right to the question, right? The fact that you could drive that thing every day and gas it up and drive it in the rain and do whatever else, right? I mean, they, they just kind of do everything. Yep. And they're so simple that it uh, it's something that you can keep going. And, you know, I love sports cars and two-seaters and roadsters and all the other cool stuff that's out there. But for all around her, that one, that one was a quick answer for me. Well, plus the uh, back seat folding up, I put seat belts in the back for my kids because they were little when I had the car. Uh, so I installed some seat belts. I found a great company that made replica seat belts with the Cobra, Cobra symbol in them. It had the lap belts, the airplane type lap belts in the front. So I always kind of worried a little bit about if I ever hit something, my head going into that, that wooden steering wheel. But the kids were safe in the back. Yeah, it's the car to have. So, so Randy, let's let's talk business for a second. In June, Bring a Trailer was uh, sold to the Hearst Corporation. Tell us about that. The uh, why you made the decision to stop being independent, and what you see the growth potential is to being allied with a, a multi-billion-dollar corporation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are super excited about this, and we uh, have had this as sort of a long time coming. It's been a long process here. We've been running. BAT since 2007. Some people realize that it's uh, 13 years online, and I've been doing it full time, as you said in the intro, for 10 years. And we launched. I mean, the really giant turning point that everybody has seen so visibly was the launch of Bring a Trailer Auctions in 2014. So we've been doing that for six years. You know, 30,000 cars have gone through there now, and it's just frankly, Keith, not a you know little mom and pop sort of operation anymore, right? I mean, there's a bunch of employees and we moved into a new facility in San Francisco and the challenges become different from when you're going from a, you know, two or two or three person show and, and, and building up. And now, you know, you're at a bunch of employees and you need support and, and you have a offering that people expect to be at a very high level. So you need, you know, customer service teams and, and, you know, different sorts of infrastructure. I mean, we're talking right now, I'm like, I'm, I'm into cars and I'm into turning wrenches and I'm, I'm really into the auction um, sort of dynamics and the product and how that all works. And obviously we've been refining that ever since we rolled it out and making it better and better. But you get to a point, you know, we're at 300 auctions a week and even more people want to use the service. And there's a line around the block of people that are excited to list their car on BAT. And we, we really just need to level up and figure out how to keep the specialness of BAT and the authenticity of BAT, which we've built from very small and yet still be able to serve and let so many people use the product. Cause I really feel like it's the best online design for how you can transact a special vehicle. And so that means, you know, we want to get as many people to be able to experience that as they can and, and have this sort of transparent model um, be out there in the general marketplace. So we've got to grow to do that. And Hearst is a, yeah, as you mentioned, they own, you know, hundreds of companies and they've done so much of the operational and support side before over and over and over. And they're, and they're very good at it. And they can really help support us there without honestly doing too much on the front of the website. They can just support our team and our technology and that sort of thing. So that's why we uh, we linked up with them. And yeah, it's going to be sort of the next chapter of BAT. Congratulations. Randy, you're at 300 cars a week. What do you think your upper limit is in terms of number of car classic car auctions that you could have in a week? Honestly, yeah, I, I love that question. And Keith, we've been asking that question every year since 2014, right? And in 2014, we launched it uh, with that M3. We had three cars a week, and then, and then we had uh, 10 cars a week, and then we had 40, and then we had 50, and then we had 100, right? And each time we've looked in the mirror and been like, how big can this be? Like, are there enough customers? Are there enough good cars? Right. You don't want to we curate. So you don't want to throw it open to just like for volume. You get a bunch of junk being sold. Nobody wants that. So it's still curated and it's the special stuff. But how many special ones are there every week? And we've been 
continually just amazed that like the ceiling's always higher, right? When you get to 100, you're like, no way we can do 150 or 200. And then you get there and then you get to 200 and you say, no chance we can support 300. And then we're now we're at 300. So now that question there's just kind of no way to answer it, right? Because the uh, now that we're at 300, the way the internet works, the way information proliferates uh, out there, like we've got a line around the door even at 300. So we think it could be uh, in the high 300s or 400 even today. And we haven't even tapped into Europe, uh, you know, other international opportunities. There are other, you know, areas and corners of the uh, collector car space, you know, in hot rods and different sorts of things that we we aren't particularly deep there, right? We kind of started from a lot of overlap with the type of cars you feature in SCM. And th- but there's other places you can push on this to to offer this product to them. And quite frankly, we've been shocked at how applicable it is for nearly new special cars, right? Like it's the best place to list a, you know, Porsche Cayman GT4. And we've done a ton of them really successfully. And now there's a trend line and now there's a marketplace for that audience. So we thought it'd be all 65 Mustangs like we've been talking about, right? And vintage and and older restored and collector cars or projects. But I mean, there's a, you know, a special BMW that rolls off the line, like those sort of 2017, 18, 19, 20, 20 cars are moving through BAT successfully because there's a passionate audience. So the size is, it's really the sky's the limit. The, the more important part than volume is keeping that specialness, keeping the uh, excitement and making it not feel like just a commodity marketplace, which nobody wants. Let me ask you a, a philosophical question about the fees you charge. You cap your auction fee at $5,000, regardless of the value of the car. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So now with this, let's say the Miura sold for a million dollars. Some auction houses would charge 10%. That's a $100,000 fee. You're potentially giving up $95,000 in a commission. How did you come to that decision and what makes you stick to it? I've always just had not a great feeling around high fees. You know, I don't know. You guys, um, I'm, I've been very lucky to, you know, we got to buy a house when we lived in San Francisco and you look at like what the realtor fees are and you like fall off your chair. Right. And I uh, was lucky. My dad would take me to Monterey and we'd go to the auctions and, for whatever reason, I'd like turn the catalog back to the page where it talked about fees. And then I'd run the math in my head and I'd be like, okay, that car sold for, uh, yeah, 500 grand. Right. And there was, you know, 10% coming and going. And this was in the time when I was buying, you know, land cruisers for $5,000. I was like 50 K is not an auction fee. That's like a sports car just out of the fees. Right. I mean, I was like, that's crazy. So I could never wrap my head around that. And I always came from the perspective that, you know, the the buyer and the seller would obviously rather that those were a whole bunch lower. So we kind of designed that in and the internet does an interesting thing, right? You don't need to put up the stage lights and you don't need to print a million catalogs and you don't need to, you know, serve the champagne in the room and all this stuff. All the cost structure is totally different. So we could try to go head to head with those guys and charge a hundred thousand in fees on that Mura. But it was like, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And it doesn't, honestly, for what's being offered, it just didn't feel right. So we capped it. It also works really well. Everything online is done with credit cards. Uh, If we went after you, Keith, buying that Jag, trying to, trying to get a hundred thousand dollar fee out of it, that wouldn't work on many people's credit card that I know. (laughs) Right. So um, it all just puts a nice, downward pressure on it. And honestly, I mean, we get some people that are like, how dare you take a $5,000 fee on a, on a $600,000 car? You know, I mean, some people, if you're not comparing it to the craziness of auction fees, um, that's a lot of money. And I agree with that. So we try to do a, uh, what we thought was an appropriate model. Again, we just invented this thing in 2013, 2014 on a whiteboard. And we're like, what would be the best way? And frankly, our fee model, we haven't changed at all. It's been the same the whole time. Yeah, the last thing, Randy, would be with the, the, the pandemic and the virus and all that, do you think that's changed Bring a Trailer's role in the collector car world? I think that it's been very interesting to watch. I think if it has, it hasn't been intentional, right? We've all been just sort of sitting here in reaction to how society has changed uh, and continues to change and everybody watching the news and, you know, figuring out what's going to happen. And it certainly has changed online commerce role in everyone's life and our dependence on that 
and also entertainment, you know, and, you know, nobody's going out to the movies anymore. They're looking for entertainment either at home or on their device. And there already was a swell towards online commerce and capability in the auction space. I mean, we were, we've been seeing success over the past several years and more and more people adopting it. But I think it just became a, a giant wind at our backs, frankly, in March when everybody went home. There was sort of a couple of unstable weeks where even even for online, nobody was buying anything. People were kind of like, what's the new world like? And then it was just a rocket ship of traffic and continued sales and different things that, frankly, we weren't anticipating. And we were very fortunate to be there and really very fortunate to be able to help, you know, a lot of Sellers on BAT are brick and mortar dealers or people, you know, who have had job changes or whatever, and they have been able to utilize us as sort of their online outlet very quickly instead of trying to build their own or do, do something else. So I've felt very fortunate that we've been in that position where we could help all those people and be their outlet. And as a result, yeah, we've seen a huge upswell in number of listings, in number of customers, in number of people viewing every auction. So it's certainly an interesting environment right now. And I think things are going to be on, on hold for a long time, right? Like I'm, I'm not itching to get back to a, you know, baseball stadium to sit next to a bunch of strangers real close. And I'm the same goes for, unfortunately, a lot of our car events and uh, tent auctions and all that sort of stuff. So I think the online auctioning and transacting is going to be certainly here to stay. And that other stuff will come back online as well. But it's certainly been a wind at our backs. And we're excited about where it's taken us this year. Good to hear. Well, right place, right time. But it certainly came with a lot of years of hard work, that's for sure. Randy, you've taken us on an awesome ride today. This has been great to talk with you and catch up with you uh, since you and I last spoke. I want to thank you for sharing your story and your enthusiasm. If, if you were to give our listeners one little piece of advice about buying, selling, and holding collector cars, specifically at Bring a Trailer, Bat, what would that be? Uh, do your research. Yeah, like I said about the intelligent market, it's really fun how many ways you can uh, learn about the market, about different cars and different sorts of things, particularly online now in a data-driven way. And we're trying to be part of that with our scatter charts and our model pages on BAT. But there's a lot of other resources as well. So you can be a really smart buyer now and you never have to feel like you're kind of going it alone. You can jump in to, to uh, have the the other users sort of help you out, like Keith mentioned that he did. And that, that sort of environment is really different. So um, people can uh, increase their confidence about doing that sort of thing. And then the only other one is just drive them. I love driving them and adding miles. Whenever I see a special car on the road, I love acknowledging the driver and, and sharing excitement about it. That's what kind of makes the world go round for me. Absolutely. Well, listeners, again, you can find everything we've talked about on Randy Nonenberg's show notes page on the Sports Car Market website and the Cars Yow website. Uh, just go there and check it out. Or better yet, sign up, be a participant at bringatrailer.com. It's really fun. If you have something valuable to add, you can do that as well. And I just warn you, pour a large cup of coffee in the morning when their, their emails show up because you're going to be there a while. But you know what? It's going to be really, really fun. Randy, thanks for being so generous today with your time, your expertise, and for sharing your background and your successes. Congratulations again on where you've brought Bring a Trailer. This has been so good to catch up. My pleasure. Thanks so much to both of you. Thanks again, Randy. I know this is a very busy, busy time for you, and it's been great to have this time to just sit and chat. Absolutely, Keith. I love it. Man, I wish we could do it for a while longer. Sounds like you're chasing your kids. I'm chasing my kids. I'm working from home. <laughs> Oh my goodness. It's a kind of a kind of a nutty time. But Mark, good to reconnect with you as well. Congrats on all the success on your podcast. But this one, man, you guys got this uh, you know, GTV poster logo for this thing and seared into my brain. I love it. I love what you guys are doing. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> well, thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. You take care. Okay, guys, we'll be in touch. We hope to have shed some light today on the collector car market. You can listen to all the buy sell hold podcasts at sportscarmarket.com and carsyeah.com. You'll find hundreds of inspiring automotive enthusiasts on the Cars Yeah website as well. Be sure to log into sportscarmarket.com and subscribe to Keith's SCM weekly newsletter. You'll find digital issues, insider event guides, and price guides, along with our platinum database, column profiles, classifieds, and many other resources. Join Keith and Mark next week to hear from another automotive industry leader who will help you determine when to buy, sell, or hold.